our State of the Stone talks carry on uh, something that Terence McKenna started. He called a series of talks he did, uh, State of the Stone, and a friend of ours actually picked that up at his memorial, and um, we thought we would sort of continue that as a series of sort of just kind of talking about current, current trends and what's going on in the world related to psychedelics and psychoactive drugs. Uh, the world of recreational drugs is changing really quickly these days uh, with new developments continually being made in chemistry and botany and law enforcement and use. Yeah. Okay, uh, you know, the recent history, probably, uh, how many people have heard of SPICE? And good? I so, you know, we have recent history, sort of, you know, sort of 2006, 2009, there were uh, SPICE and a bunch of cathinone stimulants that came out, or sort of uh, between, you know, cocaine, methamphetamine, and MDMA somewhere in terms of effects, and something called Bromo Dragonfly, which is sort of a psychedelic kind of, people had varying opinions about it. And then between 2009 and 2013, in the last few years, um, we've had uh, a ketamine analog, or ketamine-alike, at least, uh, substance called methoxetamine, some PCP and ketamine analogs, um, these, this thing called the Yenbome series, which is actually a psychedelic uh, set, of, set of drugs that are related to uh, like 2CB, 2CI, that kind of thing. Um, and a whole bunch more of the empathogenic stimulants uh, and more synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, in, in 2008 and 2009, uh, there were a bunch of uh, uh, unidentified powdered psychoactive research chemicals that were, began being sold in slick commercial packaging as bath salts or plant foods. Uh, there's been a lot of media about those. Oops, I'm pushing the button. So you don't hit the button. <laughs> These are just a few examples of the, of the various products, including some of the spice uh, cannabinoid containing products, as well as some of the, um, you know, uh, widely available online uh, empathogenic uh, products, slickly packaged, um, really interesting, widely sold And these, the, the, and al analyzing these, is, there's all sorts of different things that have come in, come in uh, have been found in these, in these packages. And one of the kind of interesting things about, about the research chemical scene from the last, you know, sort of 15 years is that analyzing some of the, the products that get sold are, uh, they actually are, many of them are quite, quite pure. Um, so it's sort of this weird mix of sort of sometimes you get, you know what you're getting, sometimes you, know, you don't know what you're getting, but many times what, whatever is being sold is actually quite pure, and this is just a demonstration, this is just an image. This, from these a are the results from a test that we got, did of some methoxetamine that got tested in, in the top chart of the two charts. You can see that's a, basically a, a single, very pure compound that if they it, found. If it, were, if it weren't pure, you'd see a bunch of bumpy stuff going on uh, uh, next to that peak. Um, the, this, this is an image from a, 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 a Legal Highs booklet, sort of an info, info packet from a group um, called Exchange Supply, or sold through exchangesupplies.org, which is a British, uh, British group that does harm reduction work and sells syringes and things like that. And one, of the, one, of the, one of the problems is that even though a lot of the materials that are being sold online, uh, even though they're coming and being very pure single chemicals, they might very well not be the same chemical that's in the bag that was that was being sold. So it might be pure, but not pure whatever you thought you were getting. So you know the the, the spice thing has has changed in the last couple of years because uh, many around the world, including the United States, many of the synthetic cannabinoids have been controlled. And so uh, you know the K2 busts, and um, there were uh, most of the pa like for a few years, uh, spice and spice, spice alikes were being sold in uh, convenience stores and gas stations like that in a number of different states. That's no longer so much happening. And uh, just this last week, uh, the DEA announced their plan to emergency schedule three new uh, synthetic cannabinoids that are not, have not actually seen that much. Uh, the, the XLR11, AKB48, and UR144, which are just, I'm sure most people haven't heard of them at all, but they're already being emergency scheduled. And just because somebody told me before we started talking, because there's so many people and there's people sitting on the floor in the back, if there's any way that people could move in to make a little, fill in the empty spaces in the middle, that way some more people could get chairs. We appreciate it. But synthetic cannabinoids are still are still out there, um, and they're getting they're uh, they're partially because of the crackdown on on spice. Um, they're actually may may be more present now as sort of pure chemicals, or sort of these waxy compounds that are being shipped through the mail in baggies and 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 uh, in little. Con uh, Containers instead of instead of as deposited on herb, which sort of makes them. And as the laws, are, as more laws are being passed, then the the vendors start marketing them as being no DEA banned substances, which of course they don't tell you what's in them, but they're marketing them as not having DEA banned substances in them. 
as I don't know why exactly we would believe them, but <laughs> I suppose some of them don't. This is just like a, a comparison of the kind of the skeletons of the molecules um, and sort of in how the bath salt in some of the bath salt products. Yeah, these all all whatever the MDPV, methadone, and methadone can all be considered sort of uh, euphoric stimulants or pathogenic stimulants. Sort of um, you know the. So There's you can see on this the, the similarity between MDMA and the three MDPV, methylone, and methadrone, which are some of the, the bath salts. This was just uh, one, of the, one of the products that we pictured earlier um, that was kind of an interesting case study where uh, this product called Charge Plus uh, was being sold as kind of a cocaine replacement, kind of a, cocaine, a legal cocaine. And they, ch they had this exact same packaging. Clearly, they'd gotten a whole bunch of these little cards printed up, and, and they changed the formula. Um, so what, what substances that uh, the labs were finding in, in, the, in, the, in this particular package, same packaging uh, changed over time? And what's so, in, so in March of 2010, it contained a substance called 4-FMC. And then a year later, in February of 2011, it contained 4-FMC plus caffeine. And then a, year, you know, a few months after that, that changed it to MDPV. So completely different chemical, same packaging, being bought by the same people. And you know, dosages are different. And you know, in, at least in this case, they were, they were trying to sell them uh, with a consistent quantity of powder being a dose. So they were, they were padding the you know, material, cutting the material so that it was, you know, it was two doses in a packet, I think, if I remember correctly. But still, selling the same product with two different chemicals is, a, is a, one of those challenges going on right now. In 2011, there was this, this whole plant food thing, and this is just one of the products that um, somebody uh, had sent in to us because they, were, they had been taking plant food and felt it was really good for them and it really made them thrive. And, and then, um, uh, but then Florida banned MDPV, which was thought to be the major constituent of it. But this, this company then... Uh, they, they, they continued to sell the product, and he was trying the product, the, the new version of the product. Now that, and the, now that Florida had banned MDPV, he wanted to know what was in it, because it didn't say what was on the package. So he sent a sample of, a, of it to our lab to have tested, and as well as, oops, no, it's not going, as, well as sending um, the, the empty container that it was in. And so on the package itself, it lists 25 different chemicals that it doesn't contain. So it says, does not contain 5-MeO-DMT, 4-MMC, methylone, methadrone, 3-FMC, you know, the giant list, and including, as well as, you know, you can see in the middle that it says it doesn't contain MDPV. It's actually bolded on the package and, and says, you know, not, not for human consumption. So our, our lab tested it. Contains only MDPV. Right. So, so wh whether or not uh, K2 says that their products do not contain any DEA banned substances, who, who knows if that's true? It's a, and maybe it will be true next month. Maybe it will be true in two months from now. Who knows? One of the one of the biggest problems, uh, sort of trying to track this stuff, is uh, a lot of the new drug stuff. Is that the mainstream sources really fail to do a very good job, um, including some of the best sort of, sort of major news sources like the New York Times. They're kind of willing to just quote uh, any authority who says any kind of really scary thing in order when when new stuff comes out. It's it's definitely sort of moral panic world. Like this, they were willing to quote this fellow who said, "If you take the worst, uh, a doctor who said." If you take the worst attributes of meth, coke, PCP, LSD, and ecstasy and put them together, he said, that's what, we, that's what we're seeing sometimes. And so, like, it's a, a pretty crazy mix. I mean, if, obviously, if you, took, <laughs> if you took the worst qualities of meth, uh, coke, PCP, LSD, and ecstasy and put them together, probably it wouldn't be very popular. <laughs> yeah. You know, how many people here caught some of the zombie bath, uh, bath zombie craze last year? Yeah, so that, that was pretty great. And um, uh, it really stands out as a, a kind of a great example of how uh, poorly functioning kind of the news media is around this area. Yeah, this, this I, for people, does anyone not know about this thing? A few people. So anyway, uh, a, a, fellow, a fellow attacked someone else. One, one fellow attacked another fellow, and he a bit fairly him. Fairly horrific attack. Yeah, hor fairly horrific attack bit, bit the fellow's face. And uh, immediately afterwards, the police suggested that it might be the bath salts that had been going around. And, and, uh, so. And, and so there was a huge amount of media about the fact that bath salts were causing zombie people to do zombie attacks. 
And of course, there had been no testing done. And eventually, the test, they, they came back and said they had not, in fact, found any MDPV in any of the results. All they found in his system was a little bit of cannabis. Um, and, and in fact, there use. was no evidence of any, any uh, stimulant use at all. No, no, there were no drugs on him. There was no reason to think that it had anything to do with MDPV. It was Which, of course, sort of never hit the media at all. The media well, never it, went it, back and, well, got a little bit. not, the, got not a little. these people, no. not the news, not, not the television. Not there were a few articles written about it, but, but not, not across, splashed across your television at night. And, and so it got, it got to be enough where, you know, sort of a couple of other sort of violent episodes in the next couple of weeks after that, last June, uh, there were um, just other people were being blamed for, uh, I mean, uh, basalts were being blamed for the violent activity. That and this is even there. after they had announced that MDPV was not involved in the first case. So there was a second case that, was, that, that had, they were blaming the MDPV for, and they didn't even end up testing the guy, and they continued to say that it was MDPV that had done that. And the only evidence that they had for that was, I have a quote here somewhere, um, that the that the, a, a friend of the victim said he must have been on bath salts. And that's what was quoted in all of the media about it. And so there was, again, no evidence that the bath salts or MDPV had been a number involved of different, at all. A number of different media stories had this zombie apocalypse phrase in it. Um, and so that ended up being this weird sort of effect where the, the CD, the Centers for Disease Control had done an April Fool's post that whatever last year where they had they had uh, suggested that people should prepare for the coming zombie apocalypse. They were trying to pick up on the zombie the zombie fun pr prior to the zombie craze going on um, to suggest that if you in fact prepared for something like a zombie apocalypse that would be the same preparation you would need to do for an earthquake or for a for some sort of you know power outage or whatever so you know you, you, they were trying to make fun of it and then they had to actually backtrack and start declaring that no it's no. okay there's no actual zombie apocalypse happening and you know it got it got it got enough fun that someone actually made a movie that's just coming out that uh, you know is uh, about uh, basalt zombies and the new ultra potent basalt uh, batch has revealed a major side effect it turns users into violent flesh-eating zombies <laughs> and less substantially less funny uh, was that uh, Congress then uh, a couple weeks later banned MDP added MDPV to schedule one um, it was basically so, the same month that the, that, the, that the media was talking so much about these cases that did not, in fact, contain MDPV, helped push towards legislation being passed in June last year. But the, the main, one of the main things that uh, we've learned sort of working on Arrowhead is that uh, lack of sleep makes people crazy. Um, uh, people stupid and crazy. It's, it doesn't matter why people don't sleep. If it's three days people haven't slept, if it's because they're cramming for a test or because they're having some sort of manic problem or because they're taking stimulants, um, uh, it does not matter. The people do not function well. People, people act bad. People become, do all sorts of crazy, stupid stuff. So it is true that MDPV, along with many other stimulants taken uh, over too long of a period of time and without enough sleep, can cause people to become um, less uh, in control of their actions and, yep. and uh, a little agitated, but in these cases that were advertised so much, it was not involved. So this is just a kind of a, a wordle of, of a bunch of the things that are kind of out right now. Um, there are, you know, some of, the, some of the classics as well as some, some of the new stuff. Um, uh, main, main point is that there are, there is, the proliferation of new drugs these days is just, is really amazing. Just every week there's a new drug being made and keeping track of them and keeping up with them and, and knowing what the dosages are is a, is, a, is, a, is a big issue right now. One of the sort of state of the stone uh, 2013 is that uh, in a few weeks' time, uh, three weeks' time, there will, the first international conference on wastewater testing is happening in Lisbon, Portugal. So if you would like to learn about uh, testing uh, city sewer systems for, uh, to quantify uh, what, what recreational drugs the population are using, um, uh, that's, that's your place to go. And this is the first one, so you can get on the ground floor of wastewater testing. <laughs> well, it's an, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting new trend. I mean, the idea is basically you take the wastewater systems for the city and you analyze it and you can see what the byproducts of the, you know, so you can test and see what the levels, you can compare the levels of heroin use versus MDMA use in New York versus some other city it, it seems on like an it aggregate might, level. It might end up being one of the best <laughs> ways to quantify um, uh, how much people are using. It's hard, to, it's hard to get people to tell the truth on surveys and, and seizures don't really tell you that much, and so maybe in 20 years, maybe there will be sort of every city in the in the world will have. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, know. I think go to the conference. Let us I, know. Su I suspect <laughs> it will be published somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> one Which, of the, one of the you know one of the main implications of, of sort of a lot of the new uh, new drugs coming out is really just sort of people need to be able to analyze their drugs and uh, to figure out what it, what what they've got before they take it. Yeah.
uh, Arrowhead runs a project called Ecstasy Data, which the, the original idea was that we were testing uh, ecstasy tablets, street ecstasy tablets, um, so pressed tablets. And then uh, we, are, we, have, we work with the only lab in the United States that's uh, DEA licensed to accept anonymous submitted samples. So people send in a sample in the mail to the lab, and then the lab tests it and then provides us with the result, testing results, and then we publish it online. Now the DEA limits us and they don't allow us to actually identify uh, the quantity of material in the tablet, but they can, we can identify what, which chemicals were found in the, in the substances. In, increasingly, we're getting, we're getting submissions that are uh, just kind of white powders. They're, they're less, uh, and they're not, less and less ecstasy. Uh, the, you know, we, we subsidize the tablet testing because with a single pressed tablet, a tablet that shows a particular logo can be useful to other people who have seen or have bought that same exact identifiable tablet. But for, and so it's $40 for testing for those, but for the uh, white powders, it, they, we actually are requiring that everybody uh, provide the full testing uh, cost, which is $140. And one of the interesting things that I think is interesting is that even though it's $140 to do the testing, we're actually getting more and more samples submitted, which really suggests to us that people are aware that, that there's lots of different materials out there and they don't know what they're getting and, and are trying to get testing done. Another, another, you know, part of the sort of test your drugs, you know, Dance Safe. Dance Safe actually works with us on the, uh, helps, helps support the, um, th uh, the ecstasy data testing. Um, uh, Dance Safe offers field reagent kits that people can use to, to do color, color samples. It's more of a rule out test and it's more, it's less uh, of an identif identification of a particular drug. But um, there's other groups that are selling thing, selling the sa selling similar kits. So there's a group called the Bunk Police. But kind of interesting to me, sort of a state of the stone thing, is that uh, Amazon.com will ship uh, marquee reagents to you overnight. And and of course, because Amazon, as anybody who's shopped on Amazon knows, you can you can see you can get recommendations for other products based on the things that you're buying. And so so if you go and you look up a testing reagent kit on Amazon, they'll tell you that people who buy that also buy naphtha, which is a solvent for doing extractions, 5-HTP. Milligram scales, cannabis, cannabis grinders. Uh, bo books P. Call and T. Call by Dr. Shulgin. Um, whip, whipped cream chargers. E empty gel caps, The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. <laughs> Earplugs, glow sticks, and packages of a thousand tiny little Ziploc bags. <laughs> so so it, another, another kind of state of the stone thing. How many people have heard of Silk Road? So we've got a lot of people, good. It's been pu lots of stuff published about it. It's a pretty crazy world out there on, online. It's a, it technically difficult to, a little bit of a technical difficulty to get there, but, um, and, and actually then Bitcoins are a little bit of a pain to manage, but uh, it's uh, pretty crazy. Uh, there, you know, sort of cocaine for sale, you know, LSD, uh, heroin, you know, uh, ecstasy. It's a... Uh, um, one of the things that was particularly interesting to me, I mean, sort of a recent incarnation the, the, uh, of Silk Road, is that there's forums that where discussions of experience, like basically experience reports, tied to specific products. So the person sort of linking to, I, I, I purchased this product, uh, you know, whatever, this gram of cocaine from this guy on this date, and I had this experience, and and you know, I had a great time or whatever. And then the vendor says back, oh, glad you liked it. And he's like, yeah, well, it isn't as good as Jim's over here and points the link, links to the, to the other product. And um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, all, it's all a little much to take. It's hard, it's hard to know quite what to do with that. You know, like with Arrowhead, with our experience reports, we sort of, uh, we actually have a policy of removing vendor information because otherwise vendors submit review, you know, experience reports associate, and then associate them with their, with their brand, and so it becomes a bit of a management problem. But there are other tour websites. Moving on, um, one of the one of the uh, most interesting, uh, more interesting uh, things that's going on is a psychedelic psychedelic set that's being sold that came out of the Nichols Dave Nichols lab in Purdue, um, and I'm sorry, the original. Uh, research came out of there and now is being uh, produ <laughs> produced who knows where um, but it's probably China it's super super potent sort of active substantially active under a milligram and so a little 50 milligram baggie is you know sort of somewhere between you know 50 and 100 doses depending we had we had someone come up to us and show us how it was packaged when it arrived and so a lot of these materials are being shipped in a normal letter size envelope where a little tiny baggie like that size could contain 
50 milligrams or it could contain a gram, honestly, um, taped to a piece of paper that's just folded up and stuck in the envelope. But when it arrived at their house and they opened it up, the little baggie had leaked all over. So this material, which is, which is actually active at very, very low doses, had powder spilled all over the paper. And it, uh, with something that's active at a milligram, if you can see the, the powder, pretty much you've got, active you've, doses. you've got active doses. So this is just a photo that is showing that uh, those are very small capsules. That's a penny. Um, they're, fairly, they're not the tiniest capsules you can get, but they're pretty small. And a milligram is, is kind of a little tiny spot in the bottom. If, if it were powdery, that's actually a slightly, slightly um, clumpy material in there. But if it were powdery, it would easily just be a thin film on the inside of the smallest capsule that you can see. I mean, it would just be a haze, slight haze on the inside of the capsule. And then that's 10 milligrams, which is sort of a, the bottom rounded edge. It's a little hard in that photo to see that. And then 100 milligrams in a small capsule is roughly like half of the size of, of half of a filled capsule. So. Uh, two, two five I also called two CI in Bome or two five I in Bome um, uh, is showing up in blotter, um, which is you know probably overall sort of safer than sending people uh, powder packages. But um, very irritatingly, it's being put on a quarter inch acid size uh, blotter, which means that there's it's actually also being then sold as acid later down the line. So we think that there's quite a bit of of the acid that's being sold on the street, and it's hard to know what quite a bit means, so I'm not making any claims there, but is actually 2,5-I and Bome these days. And unfortunately, we also are aware that, that some of the blotter that has um, had 2,5-I and Bome on it is uh, Albert Hoffman blotter. The, Albert, the, the bicycle, bicycle ride blotter is going around with 2,5-I with and Bome on it. And another part of the state of the stone is uh, right now is just the, uh, that the drug, drug development tech is really being computer driven. Um, there's computational pharmacology and a whole bunch of sort of both free and kind of uh, commercial pay databases of systems for developing new drugs where um, people come up with ideas for structures and can plug them in and, and do kind of uh, have the computer figure out what kind of effects that they'll have. Um, and uh, it makes it faster. And, uh, so there's a, uh, in the pharmaceutical world, as well as kind of in the kind of gray market and black market worlds, there's a, a lot of technology being used for new drug development. Um, one of the near future things is uh, just the kind of simple, uh, uh, slightly less high tech thing is just being, being able to 3D print specific dose forms. Some of um, you have probably seen that there's MakerBot, they, there's, uh, there's 3D printers that are actually able to take like a sugar water material that, and, and print in 3D. That, so that's printed on a 3D printer out of sugar. Now obviously if you can print in sugar, you can, print, you can add a dose of a low dose material to that. And we haven't seen it yet, but it doesn't seem very long before you could have little 3D sculptures that um, were, that were do, you know, individual doses of individual low dose drugs. So in uh, 2012, uh, the main European drug monitoring group, which is actually the main group in the world that's doing this kind of publishing, um, uh, found 73 new substances, brand new chemicals that had never been seen before. Um, and that's you know, more than one a week. And then uh, and they're testing for this, their, their data for this year for 2013 looks like it's on track to be that or higher. So one or two new drugs a week that they're finding, that they're actually seizing and able to, to you know, test and identify and write down, which means I would assume that there's twice that many, or not, if not more, that just haven't yet been seized. So there's you know, sort of a few responses to that going on in the world, sort of kind of the drug law world. Is sort of in the United States, of course, everything that's new is, being, is just being banned. Um, in, in Russia, they thought it would be a good idea to, to ban the information about it. Um, uh, so so as, as of uh, was February, it, 1st. February 1st, uh, Arrowhead is now listed on a list of, of officially banned ISPs are required to block Arrowhead in Russia. <laughs> so most of the, ISP, the ISPs are being slow about it, but they're starting to one by one start blocking it. So one of the most interesting things that's, that we think is going on sort of international drug policy is in New Zealand, where there's a psychoactive substances bill, which has not actually been passed yet, but the, uh, every, the news and other inside sources and inside sources say that the Prime Minister's office has uh, agreed to it, and the head of the Ministry of Health has agreed to it, and the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency in New Zealand has, uh, has agreed to it. And it's being developed in conjunction with an organization called Stargate International, which is one of the two? What's the other one? Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Oh, good. I didn't know. Two what? <laughs> uh, it's called Stargate International, which is one of the companies that is actually making and distributing party pills. So it's actually an or a, a cooperative... Um, Drafted draft. together with, with, uh, with both the kind of the weird... I'm sorry, the uh, uh, more subculture-y 
kind of legal alternative to uh, illegal drugs group. And the, the, the interesting thing about it is that, that unlike any other legislation that we're really aware of, it creates a category for legal recreational drugs. So it would, it's taking new, newly developed substances and instead of the idea being that you immediately schedule them, what you do is you require that the people who are selling them track adverse events that, that they are aware of, actually only, gather only, data about them. Only sell them to people who are 18 and over. Um, there are certain uh, information requirements. And then the idea is that uh, as you learn which of the new drugs are more dangerous and which are less dangerous, you ban the more dangerous ones and you continue collecting data about the less dangerous ones. So it's a really revolutionary new bill and that there's it's looking like it has a good chance of actually passing and becoming law maybe the, later the, this year. The details, obviously, of the regulations will determine whether or not this is uh, actually different than just banning everything new, or it's just a different, co uh, a different way to cover banning everything that's new. I think that we can probably end there. You donate to Arrowhead by walking up to us and handing us a check, or uh, you can go go down to our table uh, down in the in the downstairs if you want to check out. Arrow, and Arrowhead is a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, ta tax deductible charitable organization in the United States, and we definitely need your support. Arrowhead is primarily supported by small donations, fifty to one hundred dollars, uh, you know, whatever, thirty to one hundred dollars. And you can donate through the website, of course. Yep. Okay. So. Yep.